Well, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this very exciting two-day workshop. Um, I'm often asked why is it important to have new, improved animal models or tools to study these prevention technologies that are being developed. And I think when one looks at this slide, the answer is clearly quite obvious. We have, when you look at the annual burden, global burden of sexually transmitted infections, you can see that it's, it's not a small issue. We have over 130 million cases of chlamydia, 143 of trichomonas, Neisseria gonorrhea, 78 million. We don't really know how many mycoplasma genitalium infections we have. They have no really good data on that currently. And of course, if we talked about the HIV or viral infections, the numbers would be even more daunting. But the important thing uh, to realize is that with these pathogens, we do not have any vaccines. The majority of the infections that they cause are asymptomatic. If they're diagnosed properly, antimicrobial treatment is available. But another huge problem that we have is with Neisseria gonorrhea because it's now a global epidemic with it being antimicrobial resistance. And lastly, the impact that these pathogens have on female reproductive uh, fertility is very devastating. And if you have one of these bacterial or protozoal infections, you are at a higher risk for acquisition of HIV should you be exposed. So when one thinks about animal models, what are the characteristics what does this model have to have in order for it to be useful? So I think about the physical characteristics of the model, its reproductive characteristics, and lastly, its susceptibility to human sexually transmitted infections. Because the model has to have utility, we have to be able to measure safety and efficacy. And as you can see across the bottom of my slide, there are lots of small animal models that have been used, and each one of these have their strengths and limitations. But today, my focus is going to be on the pigtail macaque. And let me introduce her to you. I know Laurel did a bit of this already, so I'll quickly go through it. But here you can see her physical characteristics. She's an ideal size animal to work with on a daily basis. She's sexually mature at age four. Her menstrual cycle, as Laurel mentioned, is about one month, like human females. And importantly, her reproductive tract is analogous to that of the human female, and this information was documented decades ago and is uh, in the literature in terms of her anatomy and physiology of the menstrual cycle, as well as the vaginal and rectal ecosystems. Here you see her menstrual cycle. And we can actually visually monitor her cycle by looking at the perineal sex skin or tumescence as it shrinks and swells over the course of the cycle. Here you can see at ovulation, the sex skin is very large, shiny, and very firm. We can also monitor the cervical vaginal secretion using colposcopy. Uh, so you can see um, the secretions over the course of the cycle. We can also more quantitatively measure where the animal is in her menstrual cycle by actually measure it, measuring circulating levels of estrogen and progesterone. And I'm actually doing that work in collaboration with Dr. Erickson's endocrinology laboratory um, at Oregon. This is the gross anatomy of the pigtail macaque uh, reproductive tract. It's about one third the size of a human reproductive tract. Here you see the very lush vaginal mucosal folds. This is the ectocervix, endocervical canal, fundus of the uterus, and the tubes. And by colposcopy, you see a couple of different examples of uh, normal macaque cervices. Here you can see this animal has ectopy. Ectopy simply means that the pseudostratified columnar epithelium that line that endocervical canal have migrated out onto the surface of the cervix. Why is that important? These are the target cells that would be infected by chlamydia or Neisseria gonorrhea or these other pathogens should uh, the person be exposed. Additionally, ectopy is a very common occurrence in young adolescent women who are at high risk for acquisition of HIV and STIs if they don't use proper protection. 
We also compared the histology of the reproductive tract between the pigtail macaque and the human female from the lower all the way to the upper reproductive tract. And what you can see is the vaginal and cervical epithelium is about 30 cell layers thick of stratified squamous epithelium. Then we have the thinning of the epithelium in the endocervix. And then we have the endometrium with these um, glandular structures that are supported by a dense stroma. And finally, the very delicate mucosal folds that line the fallopian tubes. This is just a higher magnification of that transition zone where we see that dramatic thinning of the stratified squamous into the pseudostratified columnar. This is the area where um, should you be exposed to um, one of these STIs or HIV, um, these are the target cells for that infection. As well, over the decades, I have collaborated with Dr. Sharon Hillier's laboratory uh, in Pittsburgh at McGee Women's Institute. We evaluate by culture the microorgan microorganisms that are normally present in the macaque uh, vaginal flora. So here you just see the list that we routinely culture from the macaque. Additionally, we compared 166 samples from the pigtail macaque to 171 samples by culture from the vagina of human females. And I think you can look at this very quickly, and by culture, it is quite similar. But in addition to that, we have moved forward, and Dr. Hillier's lab and Dr. Ravel's lab did a, a study where they actually compared the two methodologies utilizing 36 samples. And using these 36 samples, we found that 82 unique genera and families were identified by both of these methods. And when you look by both methods, 25 of the 82, or 30 percent, were identified. 24 percent were identified by culture independent methods alone, and by cultivation only, 45 percent. We have continued our work on comparing these methodologies with culture and the culture independent approach at the University of Washington. I'm working with Dr. Frederick's lab at the Fred Hutch. We recently collected over 250 samples over the course of two menstrual cycles. So we will have more data that will be comparing these two methodologies so that we can better characterize the microbiota. It's important to realize, too, that these MPTs are, are needed for the rectal compartment as well as the vaginal compartment. So we looked at the uh, biopsies from the human and the macaque anal canal, and what you see here is that it's, pseudo, or it's stratified squamous epithelium, but it's only about 15 cell layers thick, so it's half the thickness of the vaginal uh, uh, epithelium. But the transition zone in the rectal compartment and the vaginal compartment are quite similar. As well, we compared by culture the rectal microflora in the macaque and in the human. And it's interesting to note that we actually have an increase in H2O2 producing lactobacillus in the rectal compartment uh, in the macaque. It's higher than in the human. So this slide then is just a quick summary of the two species and of the two compartments. I think the biggest difference is that by culture, the amount of lactobacillus, it's about two logs less than that in the human vagina. So moving forward, the pigtail macaque model has been extremely valuable for me in my studies looking at a variety of preclinical testing, but the focus today will be on the MPTs. MPTs provide women and young girls more choices for their sexual reproductive health needs. The goals for the development of these MPTs include reducing unintended pregnancies, reducing STIs, including HIV, reducing maternal mortality, and certainly reducing the costs associated with uh, treatment of these STIs. And we hope with that it would also increase educational awareness 
and improve women's reproductive health and family life. So this slide simply shows the target parameters uh, that they hope to have in these MPT products. First and foremost, they want them to be women controlled, to be used discreetly, uh, to have a very low cost, be easy to use, stable shelf life, and so on. And certainly we want it to be safe in terms of the tissue and in the uh, balance of the microbiota. So here you see several examples then of these women-controlled topical products that are currently available. There are devices such as the intravaginal ring. There are also diaphragms. There are tablets. There are films. There are foams, gels. These products may also have contraceptives added to them. So then after, after drug discovery and the products have actually been formulated, this formulation then needs to go back to the preclinical animal model for evaluation so that we know whether or not we can actually retain the product. Will the drug be released? Does it have any kind of an impact in a negative or adverse way on the microbiome or on the tissues? And finally, can it deliver the active drug to prevent the STIs and the HIV? So in our hands, when we do our safety studies, we do actually use colposcopy. We look at microflora, pH, and gram stain for uh, acute immune responses. And if we have an acceptable safety profile, as is shown here, the product um, is then recommended to move forward into efficacy studies. However, if we see major adverse events, such as breaks in the epithelium, bleeding or sloughing of tissues, uh, reduction in uh, H2O2, production in the flora or suppression, uh, increase in an inflammatory response. We give it an unacceptable safety profile and we recommend to the drug, to the developers uh, of the formulation, to the formulation developers, that it actually be reformulated and then sent back to us for yet another safety evaluation. For colposcopy, we actually follow the World Health Organization's clinicians' guidelines and from that, we have moved forward and in our macaques have come up with our own macaque um, colposcopy guidelines so that it's a standardized approach so that we can actually identify abrasions or ulcerations um, that are produced by products. And I'd like to show you an example then of Pro 2000. Well, first I'll back up and say, we have evaluated 36 of these products in the vaginal compartment for safety. Of those 36, 31 have had excellent safety profiles, but five have not, and they've been reformulated and we've reevaluated those. And Pro 2000 is a good example of how useful this model is in looking at safety issues. When we first started, I was asked to do safety evaluations of the 4% formulation of Pro 2000. And we actually sent these pictures live time to the product developer and to the NIH because I stopped the study midway through. We saw epithelial disruption, ulceration, uh, friability of the tissue, which simply means you touch it with a cotton tip swab and it bleeds. So the next formulation, and so we recommended reformulation. They sent me a 2% gel of Pro 2000. And once again, we were somewhat alarmed. We saw, again, epithelial abrasion, disruption, friability. And so once again, we recommended reformulation. And the third time around, we got a 0.5% gel, and it showed no adverse findings. By colposcopy, this just simply summarizes the adverse events. We saw the majority in the cervix and in the vagina with both the 4% and the 2% gels, and nothing uh, with the 0.5% or the HEC placebo, uh, universal placebo. On follow-up, which is day five, after four daily applications of these products, um, we also do a biopsy to look for any um, inflammatory responses. And what you can see here is with the 
uh, we still had quite an influx of PMNs in the, both the cervix and the vagina with the 2% formulation. So this just quickly summarizes in those three um, different formulations of the Pro 2000 that the 4% the and 2% were not acceptable, but when we finally got to the 0.5%, we had acceptability within a normal range for safety, and it was this product then that was moved into a clinical trial. I also said we need to evaluate these products, or some people wish to have their products evaluated in the rectal compartment. And to do that, we actually uh, collect rectal lavages and look at them under the dissecting microscope and measure sheets of epithelium, presence of blood, or even presence of dense stroma attached to the epithelium um, in the lavage samples after they've been exposed to product. As well, we identified uh, development criteria for the rectal compartment. Primarily, we look at the rectal lavage, uh, if it's safe without shedding of the epithelium, um, it gets a safety and we move forward with efficacy. Uh, however, if we see shedding of large pieces of the epithelium or blood in the lavage, it gets a reformulation recommendation. And I'm going to show you here an example of um, a combination product that fails the rectal safety criteria. <coughs> and I will say this, the individual products and the combination product all had excellent safety profiles in the vaginal compartment. In the rectal compartment, even the individual components had very good rectal safety. But when it was combined, and put in the rectal compartment, we found that we had um, bloody lavage, shedding of the epithelium, and in fact, the epithelium wouldn't stay together. It fell apart under the dissecting microscope, so we couldn't even measure the pieces of tissue. So that points out the important thing that when a product gets reformulated and it has had a, a good safety profile, um, that you can't assume that is going to be safe in another compartment. In terms of efficacy, we have been asked to evaluate <clears throat> several products against chlamydia trachomatis and a single product against trichomonas vaginalis. And as you can see here, of all the products that we tested for efficacy against chlamydia, none of them give us complete protection. And with the trichomonas vaginalis, we actually did have partial protection. So I'll sum, summarize this, the pigtail macaque model. She is a clinically relevant model for assessing vaginal and rectal safety of these topical multipurpose prevention technologies. Col colposcopy is a valuable indicator of adverse tissue responses. The rectal lavage helps us identify product toxicity in, in uh, our macaque model. We are able to assess the product's ability to prevent cervical and or rectal infections with human isolates of C. trachomatis or vaginal infections with T. vaginalis. Currently in the lab, we are working very diligently to develop uh, an infection model of Neisseria gonorrhea so that we can add that pathogen to our, our list for efficacy studies as well. And I think uh, we have demonstrated that the macaque model testing is really critical in product selection so that we move the right products into clinical trials. We have expanded our safety model, extended the safety studies now to two weeks in length. We've added coital visits to look at the impact of coitus on products distributions, whether or not they're retained in the vagina or in the rectal compartments. Um, we do PK and PD measures. We can track dissolution and distribution of our products using MRI technologies and, of course, doing our efficacy studies. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and acknowledge all of the people in my lab and at the University of Washington who have worked with me on these multiple SEI pathogens 
as well as Sharon Hillier's lab for the uh, quantitative culture, funding, of course, and the research animals coming from the Washington National Primate Research Center. Thank you. Thank you. You, um, how much communication is there between the microbiome of the vaginal tract and the, and the rectal tract? And for example, are they correlated? And when you see a, 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 a formulation affecting one of them, like the rectal part, did it actually change things in the vaginal tract as well? You know, I haven't, that's a very good question. Um, we did not look to see if there was crossover of toxicity um, from the rectal compartment to the vaginal compartment, but um, we already had tested all of those products vaginally and knew, knew they were safe, so I didn't expect that that would be a crossover problem. I can tell you with the efficacy studies, though, there is crossover from the vaginal to the rectal compartment. If you infect in the vaginal area, you can transmit, or they do transmit to the rectal compartment. Transmit what? The infection. Oh, the 